But now watch this. If God kills the lie, who can keep it up? See, this Herod wanted to, to extinguish the light of the star. But simply because he was, he was jealous and grieved and envious, did not make the star lose its illuminative uh, uh, illumination. So in other words, because people don't like you, don't, won't stop God from blessing you. you're going to stay with this thing and you're not going to move. Amen. You're going to make the mountain move, but you're not going to move. Amen. Come on, say amen to this. Amen. All right, how many of you ready to get into the word of God? Amen. All right, I want to talk to you about the impact of Jesus' birth. The impact of Jesus' birth. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but um, there's a lot to this. There has and always is a competition for the position of being the one king eternal who is Jesus Christ. Um, the Lord spoke to me. I've never shared this lesson anywhere. And he said, George, there were two Bethlehems and are. There were two kings and there were two laws, all competing for the one position of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's unwrap this. Amen. In St. Luke chapter 2, verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel, in other words, the angel came and announced Jesus' birth, Jesus' nativity, to these shepherds who were guarding their flocks by night. We know that this was probably sometime in April, but uh, Christmas is celebrated on the 25th of December. So regardless of what day Jesus was born, we're just glad he was born. <laughs> Come on, amen to God. And uh, so there was one angel, and now there's a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. Can you imagine this scene? That there's a heavenly host with an angel making the proclamation, glory to God in the highest. This is at the birth of Jesus. So Jesus' birth brings glory to God, who is the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, can you show me what this word goodwill literally means? It's translated, this word goodwill is taken in many places of the Bible. So uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11 is the most familiar passage. This tells us that until Jesus was born, God could not promote his goodwill towards us. So Jesus' birth started a new time period called the New Covenant where God could now promote his goodwill to his people. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts. In the Old Testament, before the birth of Jesus, they were just thoughts. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Here's goodwill. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected or calculated, predetermined end. That's goodwill. Look at verse 12. Then, here's the goodwill. You'll be able to call upon me because Jesus has come. And you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken or answer you. Isn't that, isn't that good news? Yeah. And then you'll seek me and find me. I won't play hide and seek with you because this Jesus has come. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And we know that Jesus has done that for us by placing us, placing in us God the Father and placing us in the Father. Verse 14, And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. So anything that's been binding you this year, the birth of Jesus has come to turn away your captivity. Amen. That's goodwill, amen, and good news. And I will gather you from all nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. This is a very interesting verse. The entire context of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is contrasting the old law 
Ten Commandment law with the new covenant of grace. God's love worked out for us through Jesus Christ, where now we have right standing. Everyone say right standing. Right standing. We have right standing. We've been made righteous. We are justified. We stand righteously before the Father as if we've never sinned. For those of us who have accepted the death of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to cut into verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, elpis, confident expectation of good in our future, we use great plainness of speech, and I'm trying my best to be more plain because I understand the message of the new covenant. Remember, God is a dispensational God. Now, how many days did it take God, as we hasten along, how many days did it take God to recreate the earth after Satan was banished from heaven? We know that from Isaiah chapter 14, other passages over in Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, Satan was cast out of heaven. He was a high archangel. He, he uh, now has rebellion in his heart. Jesus cast him out. He falls into the earth, and there's a great explosion. Everything goes black, fades to black in its truest form. And um, we know from that point that Satan is really jealous of God. He, he says, I will make my throne like unto the throne of the Most High. In other words, Satan always wants someone to bow to him just as we do in due reverence bow to our Lord Jesus Christ. Have I named in anywhere? Amen. And um, so how many days did it take God in the recreation account to recreate the earth after Satan fell into it? Six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. Why did he rest? Because he was finished, not because he was tired, because this God never gets tired. So now, how long could it have taken God? Could it have taken God, instead of six days, maybe two days? Could God have done it in one day? Could, could God have done it in an hour? Could God have done it in, in, a, in a moment, in a second, in a nanosecond? So why does he protract it? Why does he give himself time? He, he likes to, for whatever reasons, because he made time. He didn't come out of time. He's an eternal God. Time came out of him. It's his creation for man. So when he made the earth, he also placed in the earth time, which is controlled by a, a, a polar vortex system. We don't time get into all that. And, and consequently, we have months, we have years, we have months, we have weeks, we have days, we have uh, minutes, we have seconds, hours, minutes, seconds, nanoseconds, so forth and so on. But God could have done it in, in, in a nanosecond, right? But he protracted it through time. Why does he do that? Well, he does that to set a precedent. Just like that is true, God has dealt with man redemptively by dispensation, where dispensation just means manner of dealing. So the first dispensation was a dispensation of innocence. Adam and Eve were innocent. They broke God's law. They turned on the second dispensation, which was the dispensation of now a, a conscience. They are aware of their sinful acts and their conscience, conscious of all the ills that have come because of sin. Now, sin, for us New Testament people, sin has been forgiven by the blood of Jesus, right? But sin does carry a consequence. All right? Now, now, this is what you have to watch out for. God has lifted sin off of us, and, and he has given us a way to not sin because he loves us, because he knows sin can carry a consequence, and sometimes that consequence can be lethal. Amen. Has nothing to do with the blood of Jesus, has nothing to do with the forgiveness of Jesus, has nothing to do with the love of Jesus, but the consequence of sin can be lethal. The third dispensation was the dispensation of human government. We saw that in the building of the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, where the people tried to govern themselves, government without God. And there are pe still people who are godless as far as governance, governance is concerned. They see themselves, self-enshrinement, we call it. The, I don't see nothing wrong with. I don't, the, it's, it's all right to me, see self-enshrinement. And then fourthly was the dispensation of, um, if you will, the law, uh, excuse me, uh, the dispensation of promise we started with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. God made promises to man. And then dispensation number five was the dispensation of the law where at the uh, height of the mountain called Sinai, uh, God now gives Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were given to prove that people needed a source outside of themselves to help themselves. They thought after they walked through the Red Sea, walls walled up, waters walled up on both sides. Man, we, they told God, anything you tell us, we can do. And they said, God said, really? Yeah, anything. We just, did you see us? Three and a half million of us walked through what was the Red Sea, and it walled up. On, but God said, I carried you out on eagle wings, but since, eagle's wings, but since you don't want to give me the credit, uh, that's what grace does. Grace always gives God the credit. Come on, amen. He says, I'm going to give you ten commandments. If you can keep them, you don't need me. But how many of you know, they never kept them. 
No man ever did except Jesus. And he kept them for us. Come on, say amen to this. Amen. Now watch this. Now notice uh, Moses, who was God was given the Ten Commandments to, did what? Broke the first set of Ten Commandments. He's the first one to break all ten. <laughs> Y'all get that by Wednesday. And the children of Israel down in the valley doing what? Breaking the first one by building what? A false god. False image of God. So no man can keep the ten, the ten commandments were given. You'll see that in Romans chapter 3 verse 19. Uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 19. 20. Don't have time today. And then Galatians chapter 3 verse 19. Start with that. It'll tell you the law was given to magnify sin so man would know that without God, without a savior, without a redeemer standing on his behalf, he had no chance to be just before God. Amen to God. And then that brought us into when Jesus was born and he died and then came up out of the grave and started the sixth dispensation called grace. Grace being the favor of God, where God, by Jesus Christ, took upon himself all of our sins, died, took all those sins, past, present, and future, and left them in the grave and came up victoriously and now looked at you and said, now I'm going to give you my righteousness. And so when you accepted Jesus Christ, the works side, the performance side to please God, that died. Now you believe by faith that you're righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And of course, the seventh dispensation will be the dispensation that takes us into eternity, begun with the rapture. Now, having said this, Paul is dealing with this in the 12th verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. In other words, the law was being abolished, brought to an end. But their minds, Israel's minds, were blinded. For until this day, there remaineth the same veil, the blindness of thinking the old covenant is still in effect, un untaken away in the reading of what? The Old Testament. Stay with me. Which veil, the Old Testament called a veil, is what? Taken away in who? Christ. So that means we're not, as Israel, we're not trying to do the Ten Commandments. Come on, amen. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, amen? Now that grace causes the do right to live inside of you. It's not legislated by law, it's legislated by the love of God, not your love for God. I'm going on. Now notice, which veil is done away in Christ, but even until this day, when Moses, the Old Testament is read and not put through the filter of the blood of Jesus or the cross, the veil is still upon Israel's heart. Nevertheless, when Israel or anyone shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be what? Taken away. Now, let me tell you this. The veil, let's use a bride. Let's use an old school bride. The old school bride has something over her face, and uh, it's just, you know, all hype now because, you know, nobody believes in what the veil is supposed to stand for. But let's still just keep looking straight. The veil is supposed to stand for the fact that the bride was never tampered with. Let me go on over to this side. No, no they're looking funny over there. Let me just stay on over here. That the bride was untouched, that she is virgin quality, right? And the veil means that she's been saving this for her husband, this, this gift of virginity for the husband. Now, this notwithstanding people, this second marriage, there's like marriage, but the first time, you know, in other words. Because, because remember now, remember, remember the covenant of marriage is, is not a contract, it's a covenant. In the mind of God, it's cut by the shedding of blood, which means the hymen is pulled away, right? In that initial sexual act, because it's supposed to be a blood covenant. Amen. Contracts are 50-50, but covenant, even if you don't do right, I still have to do right. Because, you know, we, we made this to, it, it, in the face, y'all not talking, in the face of God. And how many know if God be for us? All right, so that veil, that veil's supposed to be over the bride's face, not because she's the bride of Frankenstein, but because it's supposed to be a symbol that she's been kept untampered with. Now, remember, the groom can't kiss the bride. Y'all still with me? Y'all not pushing back. The, the, the groom can't kiss his bride until the veil is lifted. And that's what Paul is working with here. I'm getting too excited too early on. He's saying the church is one half of the bride of Christ. Israel is the other half. He says, but the church has a veil over her face with the reading of the Old Testament and still believes even they're under the law and not under grace. And until Christ can lift up the veil, he can't kiss his bride. Y'all ain't talking to me. And Christ wants to kiss his bride. He wants to kiss you in the face. He wants to walk with you. But until the Old Testament law is lifted up off your face, which came with the, 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 the birth of Jesus, which came with the death of Jesus, now the veil is lifted and now Christ can kiss his bride. And he's kissing you every day. He's telling you how beautiful you are every day. 
He's telling you you are worthy, not because of your works, but because of the works of Jesus Christ. Every day, somebody say amen. Amen. Then there were two Bethlehems. There was the Bethlehem in Zebulun. Zebulun is now a ruinous town uh, in Israel. It's located six miles northwest of Nazareth. But the birthplace of Jesus, according to Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, it's, it, and it says, I've been here, it says that in Bethlehem Ephratah shall Jesus be born. Now, why, why was he making the distinction? Because there were, there were and are now two Bethlehems. So God didn't want you to get confused with the two towns. Because one king can't be in two towns. So if you have one king, he originates from one town. Now, Bethlehem, what about this name? It is Beth House Leham Bread, House of Bread. Now, I like that because Jesus says, your fathers ate bread, John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the Son, Jesus Christ, hath what? Everlasting life. Touch two people say, I have everlasting life. I have everlasting life. <laughs> That's just one. That was just one. Find the other. I have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. Now, what does that mean, with everlasting life? I happen to know and have it on a good source of authority that when you have everlasting life, that means you will never die. Well, well, Pastor, what does that mean? There have been believers who have died. Yes, but they still had everlasting life because that was not the real them. The real you is your spirit. And your spirit has been baptized into God through Jesus Christ. The real you will never die. You will never know what breath, death feels like. Come on, amen. So now, notice this. He says, your fathers did eat. I am that bread which of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and come on, not die. I am the living bread. Come on, somebody. Which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Hallelujah. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Glory be to God. Now, what happened? Israel would never eat this bread. And there are lost people now. They're only lost because they won't eat the living bread. And of course, we're not talking about eating with your mouth. We're talking about ingesting, taking in. People still have their own way of thinking, their own way of doing. They're humanistic in their approach to life, and they will not eat the living bread. Consequently, they die. Now, what did God say? You ate manna. Where did manna come from? It came from God, and God supplied it for 40 years. God said, the law also came from me. But you ate the manna. You ate the law in the Old Testament. Now, New Testament people, you've got to eat the living bread. Don't try to go back and eat what killed Israel. Come on, somebody. Eat what you, that which gives you life forevermore. Amen. Amen. Then there were two kings. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, I think when the Lord spoke to me about two kings, and again, I've never shared this message, it was a paradox in my mind. Now, a paradox is a statement that is kind of ironic and contains some irony uh, on both ends of the spectrum. In other words, one side of the... Of, of, of the sentence or the, the thought uh, kind of has some similarities to the other side. So I think he was not just saying two kings. I think he was saying a couple of things, that the law in the Old Testament was king. But in the New Testament, grace is king. I know he was also saying, and that's what two, the, the second chapter of Matthew is all about, Herod was king. But he was looking for Jesus, who was told, he was told, would be born king of the Jews. Now, we're not talking about the king of beers. The question today is, who is your king? There are a lot of kings out here. You got cool filter kings. King of beers. Come on, y'all not talking to me. Who is your king? Two people said Jesus, but you're just thinking about it. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, now this is making the distinction, not the, Jude, not the Bethlehem that's in the northern part of Israel. In the days of, here it is, Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Notice, not three wise men. Could have been a hundred of them. They brought three gifts, but that didn't mean there were three men. Come on, how many know God always goes his nature is to do exceeding abundantly. Yeah. 
Remember, above all, you can ask or think. Remember, the parents brought their children to Jesus, and the scripture says to see if he would just touch them. And what did Jesus do? He hugged the children. He always goes further. Come on, amen. Always goes farther. Now notice this, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen, notice it, king of the Jews. So one king is looking for the other king. How many of you know, whenever you've had a king in your life, he does not like to be displaced by Jesus. See, that's why he doesn't want you to come to a good word church where you can hear about Jesus because Satan is the king of the world temporarily and he doesn't want to be evicted. And he knows if you can come to a place and you can hear about Jesus with no condemnation, you'll tell him like Ray Charles said, hit the road. Y'all come on here and don't come back. No. All right. All right. Well, we've seen. Notice now this king comes with his own star. Lord Jesus. Can you, can you see the threats? How, how Herod's position is threatened? He, he's, Lord Jesus, I, I try to hurry along. He's a king. Herod is a king by heredity. But here a king is born not out of his bloodline, but this king has his own star. And the star can be seen from everywhere. Hallelujah to God. Which means that if we can turn the high beam on Jesus, people will come out of darkness. Hallelujah to Jesus. Notice now, when Herod the king heard these things, he, come on, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes, now remember, Herod is not a Jew. He's looking to the Jews and he says, uh, the chief priests and scribes of the people, see, of the people, the Romans are in rule now. But they need, now he says, I need to hear something from those who are Jews. So of the people, of the Jewish people, he, he demanded of them to go search the Old Testament scripture where Christ would be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem, the, not the one in the north, but the one in the south. I told you the south is blessed. Yeah. Bethlehem, come on, of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, obviously referring to Micah. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor. Say it with me. He's the governor of my life. He's the governor of my life. <laughs> that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again. Come on, that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. See, this is what I love about the truth. You can hear a lie so long until a lie can begin to sound like the truth to you. See, that's subjective to your belief system. But the objective truth, the truth of a matter within itself, it will shine like a star. I said it will shine like a star. See, I've learned in my life that I don't even have to, and nor do you, have to defend yourself. Because watch this now. If, if God lets a lie tarry over your life, what can you do anyway? If God allows the lie to perpetuate, what can you do anyway? But now, watch this. If God kills the lie, who can keep it up? See, this Herod wanted to to extinguish the light of the star. But simply because he was, he was jealous and grieved and envious did not make the star lose its illuminative uh, uh, illumination. So in other words, because people don't like you, don't, won't stop God from blessing you. Amen. Come on in this Christmas here. If God be, who can 
Now, we already know people can be against us, but it won't matter. That's what one translation says. It will not. What does it matter? Whoever else is against you. If sickness comes against you, but the stars in your life, how long is that sickness going to last? How long is that poverty going to last? You're in better shape than you know. Amen to God. Watch this now. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him three types of gifts, gold. Now, how could Jesus be poor when God has already arranged for probably a hundred kings to bring him gold? He was poor. He had nowhere. I said, the Bible said nowhere to lay his head. That was in the city where he was visiting. First chapter of John, two disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and say, Lord, we want to see where dwellest thou. He said, you want to see my house? Now notice what he said there. He did not say, I don't have one. Notice what he said, come and see. And the Bible said they abode with him a day and a half. That must have been a big house to see. Let's just keep on going. Amen. And being warned of God, gold, frankincense, and myrrh all were costly. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, the then king, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child, referring to Jesus, to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, and was exceeding wroth, watch this now, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the Magi, the wise men, to tell him when Jesus would be born. So two years old, all the way up to, the, to those babies. In, in, in everywhere, even in the coasts of this Bethlehem, because he wanted to protect his kingship and his throne. What am I telling you? Satan, who has been king over people's lives, never leaves easily. And he always wants to kill everything before he goes. He's attempting to preserve his dwelling place in your heart. The last thing he wants you to hear is that Jesus came to give you life. I'll be with you only a little longer. And as I've told the Jewish leaders, you'll search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I'm going to give you a new commandment. Here it is. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciple. We can handle that one. See, he doesn't tell you to love everybody out of your love. He said, love them out of the love I've already furnished. 